Let's take our Bibles. Have your Bible. Turn with me, please, to Philippians chapter 1. And I just want to do an overview, really, of uh, all four chapters of the little letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, the city of Philippi or Philippi. Uh, it was originally a city that was founded by the Greeks. Actually, it was founded by the father of Alexander the Great, uh, Philip, the king of Macedonia. And uh, he founded the city of Philippi, which is named after him. So it was a Greek city. But when Paul was there, much later, it was a city that had been conquered by the Roman Empire. It was a Roman city. In fact, it was a Roman colony, because what happened is, after the famous battle in that vicinity, uh, the um, general ordered some of his soldiers to stay there and settle there. And eventually, there were incentives given by the Roman Empire for people to move to uh, Philippi. And so it was an established uh, Roman colony. Uh, I think it was established under uh, Caesar Augustus, and uh, he gave the people of Philippi full Roman citizenship. That city was equal to Italian soil, and he even made that city tax exempt, like, you know, like Florida, no, uh, no income tax. That's what... Uh, the emperor did for the people in Philippi. When you read the book of Philippians, and I read it uh, quite a few times through here lately, just in preparation for going through this letter, you come to the conclusion that it is probably the warmest, happiest, uh, it's a thank you note that Paul ever wrote to any of the churches. It's a very warm letter. I mean, when we read this morning, I don't know if you caught it, but he says uh, to them, how I have you always in my heart. Every time I think of you, I thank God for you. Uh, he goes on to say, "I, you don't know how much I long for you in the, the compassion of Christ. Very warm letter. He addresses some issues, however, in this letter as well. But really, it reveals how believers should live not as citizens of Rome, but rather as citizens of heaven. In fact, in the third chapter, he uses that very word citizenship, that we should live as citizens of heaven. And so this letter is written by Paul. And isn't it ironic that one of the overarching themes of this little letter is joy? And when he wrote it, he was in prison. This is a prison epistle, it's called. And uh, the background of this letter that is written is the last chapter of the book of Acts, where Paul is in Rome as a prisoner under house arrest for uh, three years. And the record of Paul's time here in the city of Philippi is in Acts chapter 16. It's one of the chapter, right? Acts 16. It's his second missionary journey when this church gets started. And you remember how it started? When he got to the city of Philippi, the first thing he did, by the way, in every single place that he went, without exception, was to find the local synagogue. Paul was a Jewish rabbi. And he realized the people in the synagogue are going to be the people that uh, have the most interest in the true and living God that I'm uh, seeking to communicate to them. Not only that, <coughs> Paul knew that the gospel was to the Jew first, as well as to the Gentile. And so he went looking for a synagogue in Philippi, but he didn't find one. What we understand is back in that day, if a city didn't have a synagogue, 
if there were Jewish people at all in that city, they would go to a place where there was flowing water, a river. And so we read in Acts 16 that Paul went down to the side of a river. Why? Because he was trying to locate Jewish people that didn't have a synagogue. There was not a minion there. There was not 10 men there that uh, they could uh, meet and worship the God of Israel. Well, he goes down there, and you remember he preaches, and there's a lady that gets saved. Her name is Lydia. She's the first person, not only that is saved in Philippi, but she is the first person saved on the European continent because Philippi is the first European city that Paul evangelizes. It's just a a wonderful thing, but you know what happens. Whenever you start preaching the gospel, it can stir some negative reaction, and there's negative reaction that takes place. Remember, there is a demon-possessed woman that uh, is on Paul and Silas's heels every day when they're going to uh, spread the gospel in the marketplace, and uh, she is following behind them. She's a fortune teller, and uh, she says, these men are the servants of the Most High. Well, Paul finally had it up to here, and he turned around, and in the name of Jesus, he cast that demon out of that girl. Well, the men that she worked for realized that their source of revenue had just dried up which makes them angry. And so they have they, they uh, stir a case against Paul. They have him arrested. You remember what happens? He gets beaten. He and uh, Paul and Silas are beaten. And then they're thrown into a dungeon, dungeon. They're put in stocks. They can't move. So what happens? At midnight, the joy of the Lord. Here's the pathway to joy. In the midst of that agony and suffering, they're singing praises to the Lord. And as they praise the Lord, everyone in that prison hears them. They shouldn't be singing praises. They should be cursing. (coughs) They're singing praises, and God sends an earthquake. As a result, all of the stocks and, and chains and shackles fall off of all those prisoners. The gates swing open, and the warden, the jail uh, jail keeper, he gets so upset because he realizes that if any of his prisoners escape, the Roman government would require his death. So he's about ready to commit suicide because he's sure all the prisoners are gone because all the gates are open. And so Paul was silent and let the guy commit suicide, right? No. No, Paul says, we're all here. Don't harm yourself. We're all here. And the jailer comes running in, and he falls on his knees before Paul and Silas, and he says that wonderful phrase that many gospel messages have been preached from. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And what was the answer? Repeat it with me. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Wonderful words. All because of the joy of the Lord, really, that these men had despite their problems. So four chapters, 19 times you'll find some form of the word joy rejoicing in these four short chapters. And it all begins, it's all about Christ. That's why there's joy. It's joy in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord, he says in chapter 4 and verse 4. It, the joy that they have is in the Lord Jesus. And the whole book, letter, is about him. It begins with great encouragement in chapter 1 that I want to share with you after we pause a moment here and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful story, the wonderful account here in the 
Roman city colony of Philippi. Lord, we're just amazed at how you, <coughs> you work circumstances. We just pray for at this time that we have together now in your word. <clears throat> Make it to be a convicting, a challenging, and a life-changing time. I pray that uh, we'd see really <clears throat> what the Christian life is really all about, as Paul brings it out here. Just thank you again for all that you are and all that you have done, all that you are doing and you promised to do, just as we read in that sixth verse this morning already, that having begun this good work in us, you'll perform it until you return. And so we praise you for that. And ask, Lord, that you would just use this now for your name's sake, for Jesus' glory. Amen. Chapter 1, and then I'll go to chapter 2, and then I'll go to chapter 3 and 4, and I have one word to kind of summarize each chapter. The first chapter, I said the whole book is about Christ, but the first chapter is really the great encouragement. And it's simply this, the key verse that I want you to look at is your memory verse, verse 21. Read it with me. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Now, what does that verse mean? Well, it certainly means that the Christian life is all about Jesus Christ. The Christian life is all about the Lord. But it goes deeper than that. Paul is saying to me, life is living the Christian life. But more than that, and this is what I want you to catch, here's the encouragement in this chapter that this key verse keys us in on, and that is that the Christian life, that Christ is the Christian life, that he is the one that lives it. He is the one that lives it in us and through us. That's what Paul means when he says, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. The reason that the Lord died for us and rose again for us is so that he might live in us. It's another way of what Paul said there in Galatians 2.20, that I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's what he means in 121 of Philippians. Christ lives in me. In other words, the Christian life is Christ. The Christian life is Christ in me, is Christ in you. To live the Christian life is to experience Jesus as your very life. Paul's not fed up with life. He's in prison. He's not discouraged because of his circumstances. In fact, if you look at the context, what he's saying here in this first chapter to these people is, look, don't be discouraged about my circumstances. Don't be discouraged because I'm in prison. Look at how he puts it here. He says to them in uh, verse 12, but I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me, in other words, I'm in prison, why did they happen? They have happened in that they have fallen out, rather, to the furtherance of the gospel. Actually, me being in a dungeon <laughs> has... Uh, brought about an open door to the gospel that I otherwise would never have had in this city. So don't be discouraged because of my circumstances. I'm a prisoner. He says, in fact, in verse 13, my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all the other places. What's he talking about? What happened was this. Paul was chained to guards 24-7. 
he had a guard on his right side and a guard on his left side all the time. And uh, every watch that they would change and there'd be new guards. And so what he's saying when he uses the word palace there in verse 13 and in all places, he's actually referring to the group of imperial guards that, uh, that had heard the gospel as a result of Paul being a prisoner. The ones that had the duty of guarding him were able then to hear the gospel through him. And uh, because the guard and the prisoner were chained together, he really had literally a captive audience right there, even though he was a captive. And so he says, don't be discouraged because of my circumstances. You know, that's the right take on all your circumstances. You think, oh, how could this happen? This is the worst thing that could happen to me or to my family. The last chapter hasn't been written. God can turn this into a great opportunity for the furtherance of the gospel, as he says here. That's what God did for Paul. My imprisonment, he tells them, actually is serving to spread the gospel and to reach the city of Rome as I never would have had that opportunity before had I not been arrested. And so the Philippian church is, as a result, spurred on to evangelize themselves. Look at verse 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Even these elite guards that were saved. In fact, I'm going to jump back here and read this to you in chapter 4, uh, verse 22. He closes this letter, all the saints salute you, chiefly, mainly, they that are of Caesar's household, which are probably employees in the emperor's palace, and he had access to them. There is no evidence of the conversion of a member of the imperial family until about a generation later. But nevertheless, Paul's evangelistic effort is extended. It's the outworking of Christ that lives in us. It's the outworking of Christ's life in you. If you get a hold of this, if you realize and you depend upon Christ in you to live the Christian life through you, the Christian life gets transformed. The Christian life becomes an exciting adventure. It's not a drudgery. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. The Christian life becomes an exciting adventure, and uh, your difficulties are not something that hold you back, but actually become the means whereby you're set free to serve the Lord in ways that otherwise you would not be able to. It really doesn't matter what difficult circumstances you're going. Here's the secret, really, of human life. You know what the secret of human life is about? It's God indwelling human beings. In other words, it takes God to be a man. It takes God in you to be a human being. There is no human life that is complete without God in them. The vast majority of people in this world are people whose lives are not complete human lives. It's only when Christ moves in and lives in you and indwells you and you then allow him to live his life in and through you that your life becomes a complete human life. I think it's the highest level of living that is possible to mankind, Christ in you. That's what Paul's encouragement is in Philippians chapter 1. In chapter 2, he gives us some examples. The biggest and greatest, of course, is the Lord himself. He gives us examples of the Christian life. 
What does it look like when a Christian is filled with God? What does their life look like? Well, when Christ lives in you, he's going to be the solution to any relationship problems that you and I have. And we, we run into them all the time. We have relationship problems sometimes in our own families. We have relationship problems with neighbors or with coworkers and colleagues. Well, the solution to human relationship problems is Christ in you. That's what makes the difference. That's what enables you to get through it. That's what enables you to forgive. That's what enables you to uh, have joy when you should otherwise be just filled with sorrow. And here's how he explains it. He says, beginning in the first uh, verse of chapter 2, if there be any encouragement, consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any bowels or compassions and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. What's this one mind? Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. That's boastful pride. But in lowliness of mind, that's in humility of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things. Don't be focused on yourself. But every man on the things of, uh, things of others, be looking how you can be a blessing to other people. Verse 5, here's the one mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He says in verse 2, be like-minded, be of one mind. In verse 5, here's the mind I'm talking about. It's the mind of Christ. He's the greatest example of how a person that has God living in them can get along with others. It's through the mind of Christ. Well, how is that mind expressed? We'll read on. Look at verse 6. Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a, literally a slave, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What is the mind of Christ? What is it that Christ in us enables, is a solution really to, to human uh, relation problems? Verse 6 nails it, and that is simply this. Jesus refuses to make his rights as God something to be held on to at all costs. In fact, when it says that he made himself of no reputation, it really means he emptied himself. It doesn't mean that he emptied himself of his godhood. It doesn't mean that he emptied himself of his deity. It means that he became a man, and in becoming a human being, God the Son gave up the independent use of his divine abilities. In order to obey the Father, he had to depend upon the Holy Spirit and not his deity to do so. You know, that's why Jesus is the perfect human example, because what he did in his earthly life and ministry was done in dependence upon the Holy Spirit, 100%. He depended upon the Holy Spirit to accomplish the life that he lived, which means then that if he depended upon the Holy Spirit, then we can depend upon the Holy Spirit because he lives in us. The result in verses 9 through 11 is God's highly exalted him, given him a name above every name. Every knee is going to bow before. This is the, the result of him 
humbling himself, of him refusing to selfishly hold on to his divine ability. When he became a man, he surrendered that so that he would not independently use it, but only as directed by his heavenly father. And the practical application is in those first four verses that we've already read. And that is when you have the mind, this mind of Christ, when you let go of your rights, have you done that? <laughs> this is really what this is about. This emptying himself, the example of Jesus emptying himself, that Christ that lives in you if you're a believer, he emptied himself. He gave up his rights. Have you done that? Are you still holding ownership of yourself? Are you still holding rights over yourself? Are you saying, you can't do that to me? That can't happen. I'm not going to put up with this. What that says is that you don't have the mind of Christ that you still are holding rights to your life, and your life doesn't belong to you if you're a believer. Your life has been bought with a price that no one can put a, a tag on. It's been bought with the precious blood and life of Jesus himself. So your life doesn't belong to you. Thus, you have no rights to your life. When you're saved, the rights of your life pass from you to Jesus. And he has total rights to your life. He has the total right to allow into your life and the experience of your life anything and everything that he chooses. Because he has superior, infinite wisdom. And he's too wise to ever make a mistake. And he has infinite love and compassion for you. And he's too loving to ever do you harm. And so hand your rights over to the Lord. As long as you are holding on to any area of your life, holding rights over it, it'll never work. You're going to have human relationship problems. Until you hand your rights over to God, you're never going to be able to get along with other people. Because when they step on your so-called rights, then the flesh is going to rise up against it. Hand your rights over to the Lord once and for all, and let him take care of it. This is the mind of Christ. This is the example that he sets before us. And when it's applied in that um, second chapter, uh, verse 12, he says, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And he's not saying work for your salvation, but he's saying work it out in your personal and in your relationship problems there where you live. Work it out. Let it be seen. Let this mind of Christ, which doesn't hold on to personal rights, let that be evident in the way that you deal with one another and the way that you live. And then he says, oh, you don't think you can do that? Well, look at verse 13 of chapter 2. It's God that works in you. The only way that you and I can ever work out what God has, uh, uh, what, what uh, we're called to work out is because God has already worked it in us. God has worked this in you. You have Christ living in you. And because you have Christ living in you, he is working in you, and we are called upon to simply work out or live out what he has already worked in us. Release what God is doing in you. Release it through you. How do you do that? Well, the next part of verse 13, because it's him that works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. If you have any desire at all as a believer to live this kind of a life, to have Christ live his life in you, through you, it's only because God's given you that desire. 
it's, as he says in verse 13, it's him that gives you that will, that desire. Do you have it? Then also claim that he can give you the ability to work it out. To work out what he's worked in, he can give you the ability, he says, because it's him that worketh in you, not only to desire to have the Christ life come out of you, but also to make it happen, to do it. It's a life of dependence. It's a life where you are depending upon the Christ in you to live his life through you. He gives you a desire, and he doesn't leave it there. He then gives you the power. He gives you the energy, the ability. To make us what God wants us to be, he gives the ability for that to happen in us. Third chapter of Philippians. Here's some what I call exhortations. And it tells us that this Christ that lives in us, that is really the solution for human relationship problems, chapter 2, is the basis for living. He's the motivation for living. He's the confidence that we should have in living the Christian life. Look at verses 4 through 6, chapter 3. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, as a natural man. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Let me put it today's language. If anyone could say I'm a self-made man, Paul says, I could more than you. And then he says, verse 5, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, genuine Hebrew, genuine Israelite, Hebrew of the Hebrews, Pharisee, the strictest sect of Judaism in that day. Concerning zeal, oh, I had that. I persecuted the church like no one else. The righteousness, which is in the law, outward obedience of the law, yeah, I blameless. So, Paul says in those verses what previously motivated him. What previously, what, what motivates you? What is it that you point to? When you say you have self-confidence, what is that self-confidence in? Is it in your education? In your, uh, in your education level? Uh, is your confidence in your ability to perform? in some particular area, your ability to work and do well, bring in a paycheck. What is your confidence in? Paul is saying that if you just want to talk about confidence in the flesh, you know, I had it up to here. I really did. I, I, I was maxed out with self-confidence when it comes to, uh, to religion. I had everything to glory in, naturally. But he contrasts his previous motivation because that was just a, a false sense of confidence. He contrasts that as being fleshly. It's just self-effort. Now all of that has changed. All that he formerly was motivated by and had confidence in all of that to him is now absolutely worthless. Look at verse 7. What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, verse 8, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but dung, garbage, manure, refuse, that I may win Christ. Here's the real confidence. Contrast his former self-confidence in the flesh, self-effort. Now, all of that is absolutely worthless. What really is the source of his confidence is who he is in Christ. 
and who he is in Christ is where his confidence is, and who a person is in Christ is only who we are by faith. It has nothing to do with the level of merit. It has nothing to do with anything that we can accomplish. And that's what he says, that this powerful life that he that motivates him, that he has confidence in, is a life that is accessed one and only one way, and that's by faith. Look at verse 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable to his death. It's a God-given confidence. It's a confidence in the Lord. It's not a self-confidence. It's confidence in Christ. The Christ that lives in him is the one that he is depending upon, and it is only by faith that he has this confidence. It's not because, hey, you know who I am, don't you? You know, some of these politicians, when they got when they get caught doing bad stuff, they, they try to pull out the, the uh, jail-free card, right? Well, you know who I am, don't you? I'm... Senator so-and-so. That's not what Paul's doing here. His confidence is not on who he is and what he has accomplished. The great missionary that he was, that pioneer missionary that, uh, that really blazed the gospel trail in the first century all over the known world of that Roman Empire. That's not what he's talking about. That's not where his confidence is. His confidence is, you know, I am what I am by my dependence upon Christ. It's all by his grace, and I'm just depending upon what he said, and that's where my confidence lies. It's not on what I've accomplished, but it's what God is in me and what he has said and promised, and I believe that. That's the exhortation here that a powerful life, he said in verse 10, I want to know the power of the resurrected Christ in my life. Well, that comes at a cost. <laughs> you want power? You want the power of God in your life? He says, as that verse continues, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable to his death. There is no knowing the power of the resurrected Christ in your life without a death to yourself, death to this self-confidence, the things that motivated him prior to, that all dies, that all becomes useless, that all becomes refuse, and the thing that, that matters is Jesus in me, and he is, I am what I am by his grace, and that's it. What he's saying. That's the exhortation. By the way, that confidence and that uh, that motivation, it never ends in this earthly life. Paul says, now, I don't want you to think that what I'm saying is something I've already attained. He says in verse uh, 17, uh, 16, I haven't attained this. I haven't attained this, but I'm pressing on. And then he, he says, our, in verse 20, our conversation, that is our citizenship. It's not in Rome. It's in heaven. We look for our, our Savior, the Lord. He's looking for Jesus to come back anytime. Are you? And when he comes, he's going to give us a new body. It's going to be like his body. And so... This confidence, this motivation, this powerful life that is accessed by faith alone, this God-given confidence, it outlasts this life and goes on into eternity. That's what he says here. Chapter 4, last chapter. I call chapter 4 enablement. It's all about Jesus, right? All four chapters are about Christ. But what we find in chapter 4 
is that Christ is not just the motivation of the Christian life, but he is actually the energy and the empowerment that we need to live the Christ life. You find that in verse 13, key verse. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. There are two ladies in this church. We read about them in the first couple of verses of chapter four. Two ladies in the church that can't get along. Sound familiar? Two ladies in this church at Philippi that can't get along. What did he tell them? Look at it. Verse two. I beseech Yodius and I be, beseech Synchthi that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Remember that mind? Remember that mind that was in Christ Jesus? Chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, the same mind in the Lord. He says, I want you to have that. Well, how do you have that mind? How can you have that mind that doesn't, that gives up its rights? and doesn't selfishly grasp and hold on to my rights. I, this is my right. How do you let go of your rights? How can you be of that same mind, the mind of Christ? How does that happen? Verse 13 is the answer. Through Christ, which strengtheneth you. What does that mean? That means that naturally you and I can't give up our rights. Naturally, you and I can't get along with everyone. And naturally, you and I are going to have problems. And when those problems arise, we have to exchange our inability for his ability. We have to practice what verse 13 says, Lord, I can't. I can't give up my rights here. I can't forgive that person. I can't let them get away with this. I can't take this. But Lord, through your strength, I can. 13, that verse, 413 is, I can't, you can. I can't, you can. And that's the idea here. That's the enablement here. It is that in order to get along with people, you recognize, God, I can't, but you live in me, and you can, and so I'm taking your can to do it. I'm trusting your ability to be of the same mind, to have your mind. And then he instructs them not to worry. Must I remind us that worry is a big sin? And it's one of the most blatant sins in Christian lives. And God hates it. Worry. It's akin to grumbling and complaining. And you remember what God did to a whole generation of Israelites that complained. God doesn't look lightly on worry. And look at what he says here. In verse 6, be careful for nothing. In other words, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything, he says. But in everything, pray. Supplication with thanksgiving. Thank God for what you're worried about. Don't worry about it. Thank God for it instead. He instructs us not to worry. Well, how do you stop worrying? You remember Hezekiah? He had a big worry. He had 185,000 Assyrian soldiers surrounding the city of Jerusalem, laying siege to it. He had uh, uh, the uh, that guy reading the, the uh, surrender letter out loud to everyone in the city so they could hear it. He got that letter in hand. And he went to the temple. He went to the sanctuary. He went alone with the Lord. He spread out that letter before the Lord in the Lord's presence. And he just cried out to the Lord. Lord, look, this is what they're saying. Lord, what are you going to do? You know, there's the answer to worry. That's what he's saying. 
when he says in that uh, seventh verse, or sixth verse rather, that take those anxieties to prayer, thank God for them, let uh, your needs be known to the Lord, don't worry about it, spread it out before the Lord in prayer, commit it to him, and then walk away, not empty-handed, but with his peace in your heart and mind. Look at verse 7. Here's the promise. If you'll do that, if you, instead of worrying about it, will pray about it, spread it out before the Lord committed to him, the peace of God, which is incomprehensible, it passes all understanding, will keep, will guard. The word keep is guard will be like a guard duty in your mind, your heart. So spread it out before the Lord, commit it to him, but don't go away empty-handed. Take his peace in hand. Exchange his peace for your anxiety, your worry. And then finally, in the uh, rest of the chapter, he, he talks about... Uh, talks about finances and material needs. And he says, the Lord that lives in you, he'll also meet all of your needs, your personal needs, your financial needs, your material needs. He'll meet them. Look at what he says here. Verse 10, I rejoice to the Lord greatly now that at last your care hath flourished again, wherein you were careful, but you lacked opportunity. They had sent him two, I think, monetary gifts. At this time, they had sent one of their representatives from the church, Epaphroditus, with a third gift, and Paul is talking about that. This is where he, he uh, gives his thank you note right here. And he says, I just want you to know, verse 11, I'm okay. Whether you send me a gift or not, it's okay. God's going to take care of me. I'm not dependent upon you. To, to meet my needs, but I, I thank God for you uh, doing that because uh, he, he says in doing that, you're really helping yourself. Verse 17, not because I desire a gift, but I desire that fruit abound to your account. You'll be blessed if you sincerely give to the Lord's work and God's servant. He says, you'll be blessed, but I don't need your gifts to get by because God's going to meet my gift, going to meet my needs some other way, if not through you. So what's he saying here? He's saying that God will meet our needs, and we should be content with that. That's what he says in the 11th verse. Not that I speak in respect of want. My needs are going to be met one way or the other. And anyway, even if they aren't, I've learned in whatever condition I am, to be content in that condition. I know how to have nothing, to be in absolute poverty, and I know how to have everything and more than I need. It's okay. How can I do that? Uh, how can I do Verse 13, through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I think we stress out more about finances than perhaps anything else. And that's a sin. That is a sin. We should not worry. God has promised to meet all of our need. And I, in the context, it's financial need, but it's all need. Because he's able. <laughs> and he passes on that, that same promise to the church in the 19th verse. He says, my God shall supply all your need too, just as he is mine. I like what the psalmist says. I think it's in Psalm 37. David, he says, I was young, and now I am old. And I have never seen the righteous begging bread. Right? I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I don't beg bread. I don't beg for money. I don't beg for things. My God knows what my needs are because I tell him. And he supplies those needs the way he wants, when he wants, and if he wants. Sometimes what I think is my need, he doesn't. 
and he shows me, and then I'm good with it. Here's the thing, folks. The book of Philippians is a little letter of hope. It's warm. It's hope-filled. It shows us what the Christ life is really all about. Isn't it practical? Isn't the Christ life so practical? It's right down where the rubber meets the road. It's right down in the nitty-gritty where we live every day. That's what the Christ, it's not some, you know, life up here that just can't understand. It's simple, practical, everyday dependence upon God in every area for everything. It's a life that is centered in Jesus, that is characterized because of that by rejoicing, that is selfless in giving because you're content because you have Christ, and he alone is all you need. There's a verse in, I think, 1 Timothy 6 that, that says, having food and raiment or shelter, let us therewith be content. I change that, and I say, having Christ, let us therewith be content. Because he's enough. If you have him, he will meet all of your needs. Philippians, it reveals 2,000 years later that human nature never changes. There's really nothing new under the sun. We have the same problems. We suffer the same kind of discouragements. We have to deal with the same type of disunity. We have to uh, decide who we are going to depend upon ourselves or God or others. We have the same type of discontentment that wreaks havoc in our heart, but thankfully, the same solution. For to me, to live is Christ. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Let's bow together. While you're bowed, I just was reminded about a legend that uh, a wealthy merchant during Paul's day had heard that about the Apostle Paul, and he had become so fascinated that he determined to visit Paul. So when he was passing through Rome, he got in touch with Timothy and arranged an interview with Paul the prisoner, and stepping inside his cell, he was surprised to find Paul rather old and physically frail. But he felt at once the, the man's strength, his serenity, the magnetism of this man who was relying on Christ as his all in all. They talked for some time, and finally the merchant left, and outside the cell, he asked Timothy, what's the secret of Paul's power? I've never seen anything like it before. And Timothy replied, well, didn't you guess? Paul's in love. The merchant looked puzzled. Love? Yeah. Timothy said, Paul is in love with Jesus Christ. And the merchant, uh, the merchant looked even more bewildered. Is that all? And Timothy smiled and said, that's everything. That's everything. And that is the secret of the Christian life, to be captivated by Christ as the sovereign one to whom you submit, as the Savior to whom you serve, and as the sufficient one on whom you depend in every situation.